Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our third Global Arts Media and Writing Studies lecture in the lecture series of our sixth season. I cannot believe that we have had six seasons of this already. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kim McMillan, who is going to be our presenter today. She was originally, she was originally scheduled to present in March of 2020, um, and uh, stuff happened. Um, uh, and as a result of that, I'm really happy that she, we, that she was able to come back and visit with us and, and give us some insight into the work that she's been doing. Dr. McMillan is a producer, playwright, and upcoming Willow Books author um, Voy for Voyages. She's a contributor to the anthology Some Other Blues, New Perspectives on Amiri Baraka, um, Ohio State University Press 2021, which is just out now, right? Yeah, it's good. It's coming out? Okay. Oh, it's already out. Oh, fantastic. Um, Dr. McMillan is the, is the editor of the upcoming anthology Black Fire this time to be published by Willow Books in the summer of 2021, which is like previously. Um, no, it's February 2022 now. Oh, it's February 22. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. Welcome to pandemic time. Um, her upcoming three-part series on Afrofuturism will debut on October 11th, 2020 with acclaimed, wow, Twenty. Yeah, that happens. That happens. Okay, <laughs> it's like time is like we're both in the present and the past at the same time, and a little bit in the future, uh, which is appropriate given it's with the claimed Afrofuturist Ishmael Reed, Samuel Delaney, Cherie Renee Thomas, and Ronaldo Anderson. Uh, she produced the Dillard University Harvard's Hutchins Center Black Arts Movement 2016 conference in New Orleans, and with UC Merced's Center for the Humanities, ASUCM, and the Office of Student Life. Dr. McMillan co-produced the 2014 Merced Black Arts Movement Conference 50 years on. Dr. McMillan edited the April 2018 special edition of the, the Journal of Pan-African Studies on Black Arts Movement and has contributed to the Black Power Encyclopedia, a two-volume reference work that explores the emergence and evolution of the Black Power Movement in the United States. From 2001 to 2005, Dr. McMillan produced the Oakland Literature Expo with Penn Oakland, Penn Oakland as a part of the City, City of Oakland's Arts and Soul Festival. Dr. McMillan's radio show, Arts in the Valley, 2000, which aired from 2010 to 2014, aired every Saturday on 1480 KYOS AM in Merced, California. And what's interesting to me about like, so this is the, the bio that she gave me, which she doesn't mention in her bio, is that she's also a recent graduate of the um, University of California Merced's interdisciplinary arts program with, with the PhD in, in interdisciplinary humanities, which makes us especially proud to welcome her back to, back to talk with us today. So please, let's give her a warm round of applause for Dr. Kim McMillan. Thank you all. I am so happy to be here. I just feel, see so many of my friends and it's, it's just really a pleasure. And so thank you for being here. Um, oh, close the windows. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Close the windows outside. <laughs> okay, do, do I hit the red button? Yeah. Okay, I'm closing the windows. <laughs> you can all go to bed now. <laughs> um, this is really important to me um, for one of the reasons is that when I taught at UC Merced uh, in this couple of summers ago, I, I saw it, so many young people who wanted to know more about themselves. And believe it or not, theater opens just a wonderful part of ourselves. And we learn about our connectedness, connectedness with other people. And why I call this talk inclusivity in the Black arts movement is because when people think about the black arts movement, they think of men, oh, testosterone. And they don't necessarily think about the female voices of empowerment that were a part of this movement. They don't think of the lesbian, uh, gay uh, feminists that added so much to this movement. You know, and what, when one day someone will give a talk and they will also say they don't think of the trans, uh, the trans that act, because what, what we're discovering is so much of who we are, we've been afraid to say. We've been afraid to have that co those conversations on healing ourselves. And so that's why this, I believe, is important. I call, I, I call this 
inclusivity because I am currently finishing editing on Black Fire this time. And what I wanted uh, was an inclusive look at the Black arts movement. I wanted it to be, to see women. I wanted to see wonderful women that in the original Black Fire, which was um, edited by Amiri Baraka and Larry Neal, there were 75 voices in that anthology. And I believe about, I said, 45 in the poetry section were 45 men, and I believe five women. And so you have to ask yourself, why is that? Why were the women's voices? And I, I remember speaking to James Smithhurst, a, a scholar, a brilliant scholar on the Black arts movement at the University of, of Massachusetts, um, Amherst. And he said, if you think of the Black arts movement in the times that it was happening, you realize that women's voices, period, women were silenced, period. It wasn't just the African-American woman, it was women in general. And so we're in a different time, hopefully, although we are fighting for the rights to own our own bodies, we still have at least for the moment legislation that says you do own your body. So we will, <laughs> we will see what happens. And, and I'll give a plug, vote please, vote please. Um, so I'm going to try these slides. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the upcoming Black Fire this time that I'm basing a bit of this talk about. Um, this is the anthology that I'm editing for Will, Willow Books. And um, I just have to say this was been a, just a joy. You know, I, I was figure, trying to figure out you know, how can I get these major, major female voices in this book so we have a difference, so we really see and what I found was asking the universe for help. And I, I remember writing to, uh, sending, sending a letter to Nikki Giovanni and hoping that I would get an answer. And I, I got a note from uh, um, her assistant saying, what do you want? And I said, well, I would like this poem and this poem and this poem. And, and then she said, okay. And so I thought, okay, I have a chance. And, and sure enough, uh, Nikki Giovanni agreed to it. And then about a month later, I received a call and she said, do you need any help? And I'm like, who, 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 who is this? And she said, this is Nikki Giovanni. Do you, ah, Nikki Giovanni called me. I forgot all about the anthology. I was just <laughs> thinking, Nikki Giovanni called me. And I wanted to basically put it on a loudspeaker and open the door and blast it out into the neighborhood, you know? <laughs> and so I said, so, 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 so she asked me, uh, what do you need, Kim? And I said, well, I really would like Gwendolyn Brooks. I want Audre Lorde. <laughs> um, I, I, I want Lucille Clifton. Um, I just get, gave her a whole bunch of names and she said, okay, I'll work on it. So then she called me about uh, um, maybe 30 minutes later and I went, oh, once again, Nikki Giovanni called me. Oh. And so, you know, I'm just standing at the, staring at the phone like, oh my God, okay, this is going to be on my bucket list. You know, <laughs> I already got it and I didn't even know I had that on my bucket list. And um, so she said, well, I called this person, I called this person, and you're gonna get a call from this person and an email from this person. And sure enough, I, uh, Lucille Clifton, whose writings I used um, in my class theater and social responsibility, her daughter called me up and said, we, you know, you need help, we'll, we'll give you, what do you want from Lucille Clifton? And I'm like, oh my goodness. And, I, and, and what I found as these women were calling me is that so many of these daughters were carrying on from their mothers. They were creating art that made a difference. You know, um, Sydney Clifton works with Marvel, Marvel, in the, with the Marvel universe. And um, uh, uh, Aisha Rahman's daughter, uh, my brain went dead, but, but her daughter does documentaries. Um, for PBS and all these people, they're carrying on those traditions. And I thought, this is just so wonderful. 
And it's a network of these amazing women who are working to make a difference for all of us. And I was just amazed. And then one person said, well, you got to speak to Val Gray Ward. I'm like, Val, oh, okay. And so everyone was telling me who I needed to speak to, where I need to go. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Boyd told me, you, you, wanna, you want to, Dudley Randall's work? Okay. And it was like, it was because they had, you know, you sometimes think that you're the only one with the vision, but that's not true. Everyone has a vision. Everyone has a feeling that we can do better. We have a, we have a way of changing the world. And when you get on that kind of slope or that thing, you all start to kind of run together and like, yeah, you know, <laughs> high five. We can, we have a vision. We can change the world. And I started to see and have hope that this book could be more than just a, a wonderful uh, uh, discussion, a narrative on the Black arts movement, but it could be a way for us to approach the Black arts movement differently. It, it could be a way that we approach it with, with the knowledge that it, is, it was more, that it was like in, in, the, um, in, in several books about the Black arts movement, they give a packed answer. They, about what it was. They say, Amiri Baraka, you know, went to Harlem and after, um, after uh, uh, Malcolm X's death and he st started the school of uh, the school for the arts. And um, so that was 1965. And then the black arts movement ended in 1975. And that was a wrap. But then I speak to people like Amiri Baraka's wife, Amina Baraka, and I'm like, well, what do you feel about this? You're, it says that your husband, um, your husband started the Black Arts Movement, and she's like, "Oh no, uh, uh, mm -mm, mm -mm. no, no, no." Let me show you the book. She said, "Let me talk to you about Max Roach, and Abby Lincoln, and and the um, was it the um, uh, I've never the the models, the models that." Um, the Gadassa models, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. I'm, I'm sorry, you know, it's brain freeze at times. And the, the, the things that were happening in the 50s and the Black is Beautiful movement and, and, and the, the brothers, the brats, um, I, I need to take better notes. But the people that were really in Harlem and in and, and the South, in Georgia, in Chicago that were working way before uh, 1965 on Black liberation. And so you get a picture of the movement that, as Dr. Dor Doris Derby said, is on a continuum that, th that doesn't have a, necessarily a, a beginning or an end. This Black arts movement is a, something that has to do with us as a people, as a, of the Black race and the creativity that has been squelched or tried to be held back due to slavery, reconstruction, Jim Crow laws, but it's, it's in the blood. And I talk about it in my dissertation um, with the term that I coined ancestralness. And I say that, that in my dissertation that, that there's no limits, that, that in order to exist as a race, particularly as females, that we had to have something we, that went back to the ancestors, that went back to the very souls, to our marrow, to the knowledge that we were more than just a black body on this planet, whether it was a suffering, living, whatever. We have a, ancestors, we have a cultures that have long histories maybe not written about in, in, in regular uh, books that young people read. Um, and I, I'll just say some of the Texas um, uh, school books about what blackness is and what blackness was. I, I know there was a time a couple of years ago when they described slaves as um, immigrants. I had no idea before that, that my family was uh, uh, composed of immigrants. It was, it was new to me, but in the Texas um, book. It, it, and, and so that's really about how does your history get rewritten? And the importance of talking about, remembering, and 
writing your own histories and writing yourself into history because the way that black people have been written in history is not something that I necessarily <laughs> want to deal with. What I loved about the Black Arts Movement, it was the empowering of Black people, and not just Black people, and the empowering of people of color. Because when they saw that we were doing it, we, what do we have? We have the Asian Arts Movement, we have the Chicano, um, the, um, the Latinx Movement, we have so we Pacific Islanders, people of color, I believe in the 60s were saying, you know, we are not limited to the perceptions of who we are. We are more than those perceptions. Um, when I talk once again about the, um, um, the word ancestralness, I say the word, I look at the word ancestor and it highlights the spiritual connectedness of the black woman to her past. Her present reality represents the gathering, the ancestralness, the linking of that past to the here and now rooted with one foot in spirit and the other in this world. It is there that she creates art challenging preconceptions of what it means to be black and female. And it's not just black women. I say that in my dissertation, but it's like, what do you choose? I write it as a black female, but what are we choosing? You know, it is the ancestralness, the, con the communing with the ancestors, conscious and unconscious, that moves a black female beyond a liminal space. And I can talk to about that in my own life. Um, when I was doing a black arts movement conference in 2016 in New Orleans, I thought I'm going to go to New Orleans and I'm going to learn more about the, the Southern black arts movement. And I'm going to get money for that. And, and I didn't know how hard it was. Um, uh, Henry Louis Gates gave me uh, 30,000. Um, I guess he was in a good mood. <laughs> and UC Merced gave me um, quite a bit of money. And uh, so I went down and, and Tulane University gave me money. I went down to um, to Dillard University, a historically black um, university, but I still didn't have enough money uh, because the people that came there, what I learned, what I learned about uh, expenses too. And I remember the last day of the conference and it was quite beautiful. I heard from people like Haki Matabudi who, um, who created Third World Press, Ishmael Reed, um, uh, Mama C, Tarika Lewis, the first a female Black Panther. Uh, just these amazing figures were there, including a UC Merced student uh, who was one of my students. She was Asian American and she wanted to see these people at, for herself. And I remember her parents were like, you don't know that, you know, this is, you're going down to Louisiana, you've never been past your home. But she was determined to go down there. And I thought, what a brave and beautiful soul. She wanted to learn about another culture and, and she did. And I think she enjoyed the experience. At least that's what she told me, but she was wonderful and, and so brilliant. But when I went there at the last day, we were all in, went to Congo square and I'm thinking, Oh, how am I going to pay back this bill and this bill and this bill? And you know, what's going to happen to me? Uh. And there was a priestess, there was a priestess, there were a group of priestesses that, um, her name was Nana Zulu, that basically take care of the Congo Square. And I'm like looking like a hangdog. She comes up to me and I didn't really know her. But she grabs me, I swear. She talked in a voice that was not her voice. And she said, the ancestors are pleased. I'm like, what? I'm like, what? And she said, the ancestors are pleased. She don't worry about the money. She said, the ancestors are pleased. And I just bawled because it was like, oh my God, someone saw this, the ancestors. And it was like, there was a moment that was beyond time. It was like literally calmed my body down that once again, the communing with the ancestors, the knowledge that we are not here by ourselves that there is something important about what we are all doing. It may just seem like a research at this time, or it may just seem like I'm teaching kids, but it's beyond that. We are 
creating with other people. We are learning about ourselves. Every day is an opportunity to learn. And when I was in that Congo Square bawling my eyes out, I learned. I learned that not only was I not alone, but the, I, to see the bigger picture, to see what you're creating as an artist, and to have appreciation for what you are creating. And I, I did. I did. And that, that experience made me want to do more. It made me want to teach. It made me want to, to see beyond my own pictures. These are some of the women that um, watch over Congo Square. And Nana Zula is right in the middle with the glasses. And I felt like when she hugged me that day, she saved my life because she opened me to an awareness that, once again, that communing with the ancestors is something that we all have. We all have one foot in spirit, whether we know it or not, and one foot in the material world. And we have to create these balances. You know, sometimes we go overboard, but other times we create miracles for ourselves. Um, and I, it, Toni Morrison has an essay that I love. It's called The Sight of Memory. She gathers words that place setters conjuring the spirit, the ancestralness. Morrison describes it as a kind of literary archaeology. On the basis of some information, a little bit of guesswork, your journey to a site to see what remains were left behind and to reconstruct the world that this remains imply. When she describes literary archaeology in terms of the use of the imagination, and in my research, I would argue that literary archaeology is a bridge linking generations to the rich soil of African genius. The gifts of art, literature, and the spoken word, the site of memory opens a door to the ancestors and an imaginary history imaginative history aided by ancestralness, the gathering of spirits to facilitate the process of what I call spirit genealogy. And I know this might seem for some people wackadoodle. That doesn't matter, you know, it's, it's, my, it's my work. And I have an appreciation for my ability to be creative, to speak to spirit, to enjoy the very fact that I'm in a body and I'm creating from a point of my own spirituality. Um, uh, tonight's discussion combines some of the research that I've done as well as the anthology Black Fire this time to be published by Willow Books in 20, I made them as 2022. The anthology expands on one of the most defining works of the Black Arts Movement. Black Fire is a rich anthology. And as, as I said earlier, um, there were 75 authors, 200 selections, including poetry, essays, short stories, and plays. I use Black Fire to teach. And although it was pro problematic, I was thrilled to have the book because it was a part of what I considered a very powerful moment in time. And I remember asking Askia Touré, he was one of the co-founders of the Black Arts Movement. I said, Askia, tell me, be honest with me, why didn't you and Amiri and everyone, why didn't you have more women? And he said, well, Kim, he said, you know, I talked to Amiri about that. He said, I said, Amiri, I got a whole group of women over here and they wanna be in it. And Amiri said, we're at press. And so it didn't happen, but it made me feel good that at least it was, it was thought about. And when I talked to Sonia Sanchez, who Amina Baraka calls the mother of the black arts movement, when I talked to her about it, I said, Sonia, so what was the deal? Why were there not, well, there were so few women there? And she said, Kim, we weren't thinking in terms of a male or female. We were sending out letters. We were, we were just creating. I didn't think, oh, this is not enough women. I just, he said, she said, I just didn't think in that terms. And I, I really understood that. I mean, they were living in a time where if a woman wanted a credit card, it was sent back with the husband's name on it. You know, we, that was a time when f females didn't have enough agency. And so when she said that from the point of view 
of what I saw the experiences of women around me, I, I did understand that. And the, the critics that at this time critique that um, with a very with, with disappointment, I can only say that now by in February 2022, please buy Black Fire this time. There will be tons of women. You know, <laughs> we're making up. And what I'm hoping for, as I said, I feel like this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning, folks. You know, tune in for more. Um, there will be uh, stories about the Black arts movement that we don't even know yet because the research has not gone as far as it can. Um, when I was working on this, this uh, the Black Fire this time, I had two main goals, to give a voice to Black women authors that, that, that the time period and beyond, and to open the door to the writings of the LB, L, LGBTQ community. When choosing the title, it was pointed out to me that Black Fire this time could be an homage to James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, which gives a voice to injustice and racism in America and the importance of the civil rights movement. I speak of inclusive, inclusivity and the Black arts movement because we cannot continue as a nation to decide who is left on the cutting room floor in terms of race as well as the Black arts movement. We have a little over 90 authors in Blackfire this time. I'm very proud to have submissions from some of the most prominent lesbian feminists in the country, Jewel Gomez, Nikki Giovanni, and Lorraine Hansberry. Uh, Lorraine Hansberry didn't officially come out until nearly a half century after her death. In 2014, her estate unsealed diaries and other writings in which Lorraine revealed that she was a lesbian. Nearly, nearly a half century after Lorraine Hansberry died, her estate released some of her personal papers. One of them was a 1960 date book entry with a list of her likes and hates. On her likes list were items like Mahalia Jackson's music, um, that first drink of scotch. On her hate list, things like too much mail and my loneliness. One item that made both lists my homosexuality. And I'm like, it's too bad that we live in a country where anyone is ashamed of their sexual preference. And it is my hope that young people today are not writing that. We are who we are. And that is beautiful. Um, when I started writing the anthology, I, I, I really wanted to hear the voices when I had so many daughters of women from the Black Arts Movement, I wanted to hear their stories. And so I asked Gwendolyn Brooks's daughter, Nora, Nora Blakely, um, what would she say about the importance of her mother's legacy? And she said, the mission statement for Brooks' permission is to demonstrate the continuing revel relevance of Gwendolyn Brooks in the 21st century behind, behind, beyond. That's my interpretation of legacy, to expand the number of people who realize that reading my mother's work is not just a history lesson, although that is there and important too. It is a recognition of so much of her work being alive and meaningful to us now. You read the line, you hit the street, you incessant enemy about a homeless woman. You read the line, our flash of influence interrupted about a young boy who was shot down in the streets. You know you are hearing about today. And then you read a poem that says, we are each other's harvest. And another poem that says, it is our business to be bothered. And you know that you are hearing what we need to do. When anyone reads a book we've published about my mother, or hears a speech or watches a presentation and that anyone is moved to treat self, friend or family better, work harder to improve community or engage more with the world, that is the reason. It's reason enough and motivation enough to continue. You know, I was like, you go on girl. Yeah. Nora is amazing. If you have the opportunity, read some of the things that she's done, the, the writing she's done on her mother. She is amazing. And 
I talk about liberation in my work through healing sites of trauma. I consider for a lot of people of color, they, their bodies become sites of trauma. When you're continually told that you're less, that you're not good enough, or that your sexuality is wrong, you take that in. Uh, and the body, the body is alive and it feels that. And one of the things we can do for everyone is say hello to healing trauma. I see the work that I do as a form of liberation for future generations. It is my hope that this issue of race, a stain on the very fabric of the United States will be healed. I have used theater for my own self-healing as well as the healing of others. When I have taught theater and responsibility at UC Merced, I bring the actual authors into the classroom via Zoom or before COVID, the authors would attend my classes. To me, it's very important that students speak to the actual writers, if possible. When I invited West Coast founder of the Black Arts Movement, Marvin X, to my classes, he spoke of writing his play, Salam Huey Newton Salam. He also spoke of being a drug addict, of being strung out on crack, and writing the play about going to a crack house with Huey Newton. And the idea that he had let down a generation of possible activists because what happened to those dreams of black liberation? Now, he's a street corner poet. He, well, Marvin will find his street, street cor corners, usually around 14th street. That was before COVID, I'm not sure. And he would just talk to writers on the street. Writers, Mar Marvin said, I would talk to writers. I would talk to prostitutes. I would talk to anyone who would talk to me about art and the importance of art. And he was like that in my class. My students loved Marvin. He had a play that he wrote about 1968. It was called Flowers for the Trash Man about police brutality. And he patterned it after his family. And my students felt it because there was truth. I had one student who was Asian American. He played a black man who'd been put, put in prison for, uh, for basically being a black man. That audience was in tears. Um, several black men went up to him and say, you understand how I feel. And it was not about him. It was, it's a universal understanding, oppression, pain. And, and the actor got it. And so, you know, we were all in tears like, boy, he was good. But it's the, it's the language it's like music. It's a language that we understand through our own pain and own inequality. I had uh, 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 Paul Flores. He wrote um, La Plancas, The Most Dangerous ta Tattoo. He spoke to our class about um, interviewing 100 gang members to create that play. Uh, it, it, was, it, it was fascinating. This in the idea of removing those tattoos, removing that part of you that help, that, that connects you to that community. These plays were so powerful um, that the students, I remember I had one student, he was uh, Latinx and he said, I never ever had plays that I related to. I also had a white student who we were reading uh, Lorraine Hansberry's um, uh, raising the sun, and he was like, "This is not theater." And I asked him, "Okay, what's theater to you?" And he said, "Shakespeare." And I'm like, "Okay, so this is not theater, but Shakespeare is." And so that's why these classes are taught, so that people understand that the spoken word, a gathering, that's theater. You know, he ended up being one of the best actors in the class. I remember one day he scooted up to me, and it was like. Um, he had dropped the class because I guess he thought this ain't theater. Then he scooted up to me with the sign. He said, can you just sign this, please? I said, oh, well, you want to come back to the class? OK, sure. <laughs> you know, I, you know <laughs> I figured he needed to graduate, probably. <laughs> but it's the, you know, it's, it, it was an opportunity. And, and he took it. And he was just so wonderful. His acting ability, 
it was just amazing. He ended up doing um, some of the Ed Bullens plays. And uh, it, like I said, it goes beyond race. It, it goes beyond race. Um, these are some of my students. The, the students would paint their own sets and, and we, we'd have help from Richard Gomez, who's right over there. Uh, Richard would, his class would sometimes build our sets and we'd be outside in that area and we'd be painting the sets and, and doing the work in it. It, it was a real joy and, and thank you, Richard. And um, this is another, we, this is George Wolf's play where um, it's uh, uh, the Colored Museum. And basically everyone was shackled slaves and it, believe it, it was, it was a comedy, <laughs> trust me. Uh, and then this was the flyer that we did for the Black Arts Movement Conference in 2014 that was put on at UC Merced and truly made a difference. I got hugged by so many students, like, thank you, thank you. And they were all racist because they were looking at art that they had not necessarily had the experience with and they were just thrilled about that. And I was thrilled because, you know, it was a time when we could hug each other. I was thrilled. <laughs> Oh, those times. Um, I wanted to leave you with what I considered a powerful piece by Audre Lorde. Um, she stated, those of us who stand outside the circle of this society's definition of acceptable women, those of us who have been forged in the crucible of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to stand alone, unpopular and sometimes reviled, and how to make common cause with those others identified as outside the structures in order to define and seek a world in which we can all flourish. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporary to beat him at his own game. They will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And this fact is only threatening to those, she says women, but I say people, who still define the master's house as their own source of support. And what I say to that is, is true. Don't think that anyone, anything, has better knowledge of who you are and what you can do than you. And the master's house is your house. And the master cannot enter without your permission. So create, allow yourself to live a life that's true to you, that defines who you are. And that's one of the things, whether we liked what was written ab about women or what was done during the Black Arts Movement or, or the, the fact that sometimes women saw the movement as misogynistics, create your own movement, create your own house. Use the tools that are inherently yours to develop what will define you as a person, as a human being, and as something of importance for someone of importance on this planet. And I thank you for listening. If you have questions, I am here. <laughs> so let me see. Uh, you know, I'm not really good at this. Okay. Oh, I got like a, a compliment here from Whitney. Hey, Whitney. <laughs> okay. Whitney, you know I love you, girl. I just really appreciate her. And her statement, let me read this to you. What a powerful, heavy hitting, hitting volume that centers two long marginalized voices. Whitney, you are a genius. I'm just telling you, it's a fact. Okay, and I, got, I really appreciate the comments here. Does anyone have any questions? You can raise your hand and I can hope I, I, I click the right thing. Um, Okay, um, or the audience, any, any things you want to say, you know, my mother isn't here, so it'll be fine, you know, <laughs> so, so uh, oh, oh, hey there, <laughs> hi. Well, I'm writing a children's, well, I finished a children's um, novel, and I just want to write, and then, um, 
um, I met with the um, some people about uh, doing my play voyages to some multicultural uh, excursion into reincarnation. You know, some of the hooey hooey or whatever you call it. Um, I just want to be creative. I want to create. I want to write, um, and and just express. Um, someone said, "What are your thoughts on the Booker T. Washington W?" Oh my goodness! You know they they could have basically it was it was it was about power the schism. You know sometimes people in power you got to kind of balance, and it, it's like when two major figures in society are fighting and one stops fighting and allows the other person to just be you can't fight unless someone's willing to get in there so it's like they both had issues was that good enough <laughs> they both had issues um I, I liked them both i really did you know i i was there i believe in reincarnation no, <laughs> no i wasn't um, any other questions that I could foolishly answer? Um, uh, anyone? Okay. Um, oh, you're so kind to just raise your hand over and over again. <laughs> okay. I really, I really appreciate that it's so successful. Oh, sure. Oh, I'm always doing that. It's like they have a sign like don't bug us between three to five or something like that, because my I really believe in it. I, I have sat down and, and my father was a Buddhist and he got us meditating when I was about nine or eight. We lived in Hawaii and he would say, I'm taking you off to um, to meditate. And we'd have to sit in this difficult positions and then chant. And I'm not and I used to always think, oh, God, there's a fly. There's this. There's this. And <sighs> And, and so it was, it was pretty easy to get in touch because we meditated about two to three hours a day. And, and, and my father always talked about reincarnation um, and the belief that we have more to do on the planet, to not see yourself just as a body, to see yourself beyond that. And what are you creating and why are you here? And what do you have to give? And so with ancestralness, I particularly knew there's so much truth in it just because of experiences. Like, why would a person who really doesn't know me grab me and start telling me the ancestors are pleased? You know, um, or, or, or why would I have this desire to write about this? Because I think there is something that we're not by ourselves. We didn't, although we're in the body by ourselves, we are connected. We are, we are connected by, with so many people. And, and we have ways of just speaking of that connection. Haven't you ever looked at a person and say, I know you? You didn't know how you knew them, but you just knew them. There was this connection. And I believe that's a part, whether it's a connection with spirits or the, 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 the family line or the connection with someone that you may have met. I mean, I remember watching Henry Louis Gates do a talk and he talked about how he had a, 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 a leg that wasn't quite, it was kind of wonky. And he said, well, it was inherited. You know, things are passed down. If they're gonna pass down genes or whatever, sure, they're gonna give us some couple of words to help us out, you know? you know, watch out, you know, or, or haven't you ever had a premonition or, or, or had a feeling that a family member, I remember, this is an example, my father died in 2014, and um, when I, the day 2019, I, I, um, I went the day I was going to do my dissertation, uh, you know, I was basically having my exam. My father was born on March 17th and his favorite thing was um, uh, four leaf clovers. And so on Facebook, this person I didn't even know, she said, here's a four leaf clover for your exam. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh God, that's my father saying I'm gonna pass my exam, you know, because it was his favorite thing and she handed it to me. 
to say that you're going to be okay for your exam. And it's just like, oh my God, I probably just started crying because it was like, I, I, my father was saying hello. And so I'm now I'm crying again. Sorry. Okay. Now this other question is what comes to mind when you hear the word uncle Tom, just knowing the, that uncle Tom was a hero of the story, uncle Tom's cabin. What are your thoughts on people using the derogatory term uncle Tom on black conservatives? Well, you know, I don't really understand black conservatives. I'm being honest, probably because I don't have enough money to be a black conservative. Um, so if someone's get, you know, we live in a world where people call you the N word when you walk down the street sometimes. So I, I don't really have a thought about it. it, it it's, it's not in my universe. I wrote uh, a poem about how if it's not a part of my universe, not a part of my makeup, why am I going to get angry if someone chooses to call me a name out of my name? Maybe it's as a black person. I don't know if as a black person, I've walked down the street and been called the N word by people who don't even know me. So am I going to take some time and think about the word Uncle Tom? No, shoot, that's nothing. <laughs> it's like, you know, and besides, why would I give a person who is not a part of my universe entry to my space because of a derogatory term? You know, it, it's not in my best interest. I, I say, don't have a thought. Sorry about that. Um, any more questions? I, I, I actually, uh, oh, what is this? Interesting answers. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> They're scholarly, you know. <laughs> I, I wanted to read you one of my poems because, um, yes, I write poems. I'm not going to say they're good poems, but I write poems. And um, I was talking to Ishmael Reed has an anthology coming out. He's a, a well-known poet and writer and comment. Uh, he, he, he does uh, commentary. And he said, Kim, he said, send me a poem. And I said, oh, oh, okay, Ishmael. He says, yeah, I'll put in the book. And so this was what I wrote, I sent him, because I was thinking about our history and who writes black history. It goes, somebody stole my history. I looked for it in books, it wasn't there. I asked my people, where is my history? They looked down, too much pain. Why do we deny our ancestors? Listen, they want to talk. The voices in our head are screaming. I want to know who I am. Why do we walk past the living? Pretending we don't see the lie. Pretending our truth is found in books that we did not write. Pretending we don't need to know, we don't need to heal. How long do we sit at this table till the ghost of the middle passage rise from waters too deep with pain that calls to us shouting bodies clad in the past with words written on the sea floor, dark with tales untold, begging to be heard. Why can't we just say, I hear you? How long will little black girls and boys be told just do what is right? Look straight ahead. Don't talk. Don't question, particularly not the dead. But we are all the dead. But we are not damned. We are here, spirit warriors, rising, telling our truth. You can find us in the soil. You can find us in rooms long emptied. You can find us in your hearts, open or closed. We are still there. We breathe in centuries, the first air of truth. We wish to hear our stories told. We have traveled with you for hundreds of years. We have built great cities. We have rebelled against injustice. We held our babies while inhumanity branded and burned. We have kneeled in prayer, asking that our voices be heard. Our lineage is a past, present, and future, and worlds in between. We speak words to heal.
to find lost parts of ourselves. Don't look away. We have been in corners, in dark places. We are moving towards the light, whether you come or not. If you want to hear our sit stories, sit, question, don't deny us. Don't deny your history. It is everywhere. You have only to look. We are waiting. And so I think, thank you. I, I wanna thank you all for being here and asking very interesting questions, which I probably answered very strangely, but you know what? That's life. <laughs> yes. Aww. I love you. Oh, you are just absolutely fabulous. You are so kind and you have been such a remarkable supporter. You're in my like, thank you universe for bringing this wonderful person in my life book. Thank you. Oh, so, um, Oh, someone's left a sweet message. Thank you so much for this discussion. As a Black woman, I find your work to be incredibly enlightening and empowering. Well, I will make sure my mother knows that. You know, <laughs> She'll love to hear that. <laughs> Thank you very much. And oh, Judy Juanita. Judy was a, a former, well, she's Black Panther, and she wrote, she was the editor of the Black Panther newspaper. And she's on here, and she says, absolutely wonderful presentation. Judy, I did pay you enough, thank you. I appreciate your saying that. <laughs> no. But if you ever get to read her work, this woman is a genius, absolutely genius, Judy Juanita. Thank you and I appreciate you all coming tonight.